So in short, the um, Amico di Sandro was a creation of Bernard Berenson, first presented in a French translation in 1899. He then published it, the original English trans, uh, text a couple of years later, and was also published in an Italian translation in 2006. So he was born in 1899, and then in 1938, Berenson realized, like many others before him, including Fry and Horn, that the Amigo di Sandro actually never existed, that this was a thought idea which was incorrect. And so, in effect, Berenson killed off the Amigo di Sandro, so he only lived for about 40 years. Um, before I go further, I just wanted to point out to you um, that some of you may not realize that the drawings of the Florentine painters is available online. Um, and Itati, uh, I collaborated on this project, putting all three uh, versions of, of the text. Um, so you could find the images and the text on that website. So I think it's a reasonable question. Why should we care about the Amico di Sandro, an error made 120 years ago, about early Filipino? Um, I think that's a reasonable, reasonable question. Because I say early Filipino because most of the works, not all, but virtually all of the works that Berenson united, he had previously achieved it to the early Filipino, and then in the end he realized that um, the that original attribution was correct. So in grand part, these are works by the early Filipino, although a few were by Botticelli. So what? Why should we care? Well, I chose to discuss it today, or perhaps I was asked to, to, to speak about it, but in any case, I'm pleased to discuss it today for four reasons, um, three of which I'll mention now, and one at the end of the talk. The most important is that the story of the Mico di Sandro really gets us at the heart of connoisseurship. What is connoisseurship, or at least what was it thought to be in 1899? What were its goals, and what were its limitations? A second reason is that the Mico di Sandro has a certain amount of fame, especially among scholars of the Italian Renaissance. As I mentioned, Tizia Zambrano wrote or published a translation, co-authored a translation, and wrote a very fine introduction to the volume in 2006, and her work in part was based on a fine essay by Carl Strelke. Um, in the most uh, recent Filipino and Botticelli exhibition in 2011, of Sandro Cecchi even had a section called Amico di Sandro. Uh, and more recently, and perhaps less known to some of you here, two scholars, Ventrella and Melius, both of whom, I should point out, are not Renaissance scholars, but they're 19th century scholars, and they have turned their attention to Amico di Sandro. So he's known, he's being studied. Uh, these recent scholars, that is Ventrella and Melius, were looking more at the whole concept of creating a personality. And what is a personality? What is an artist? You know, these, these are some of the issues that scholars have been engaged in when looking at the Mico di Sandro. And the third reason, and this is geared more to the students in the audience, um, is that even with someone who's well known among scholars, like the Mico di Sandro, it's still possible to make discoveries today. These are three uh, documents which I found uh, doing research at Itati. And this wasn't very difficult research. I asked for the file on you know, early Berenson, and there it was. There was an unpublished text, which I'll get to in a few minutes, and then there were these two reviews, actually more reviews, which I'll get to, which um, I'd never seen discussed in the literature. And as it turns out, that looking at these reviews, we find that the story of the Mico di Sandro and the origins is different from what we've come to believe. So he actually wasn't born in 1899, but Berenson and Mary Casella were working on him, thinking about him in previous years. So one can make discoveries, um, even often just by asking for the right files at Velitati. But I want to begin taking a step back earlier than looking at the Mico di Sandro, and looking at um, the English poet Swinburne, who wrote this extraordinary article 
1868, rarely read today, but a fascinating piece based on the notes that he took at the Gabinetto dei Disegni Stampi di Uffizi, which had just recently been put on view two, four years earlier. So his notes were written in 1864. And this is the most extensive discussion on Filipino and on Botticelli, but also on Botticelli, on Filipino that had appeared uh, in English and virtually any language until this date. And I just wanted to mention a couple of points about this. He was talking about the drawings, and Swinburne had little interest in whether a drawing was autographed or not, or by the master or by the student. He, uh, like Pater a couple of years later, and Pater's famous essay on Botticelli drew very uh, strongly upon Swinburne, as Pater himself acknowledged. They were interested much more in the spirit of an artist, the, the mood of an artist, but not the, the details of art attributions. They were not connoisseurs. So this drawing, which Swinburne accepted as a Filipino, and we now describe as Filipino workshop, which looks to me as if it's after the painting, although in theory it could be preparatory, the painting being, of course, the vision of St. Bernard. Swinburne wrote of this, saying that a fair sample of the somewhat lean and fleshless beauty worn down, it seems by some sickness or natural trouble, rather than by any aesthetic or artificial sorrow, sorrow in which Botticelli must have taught his pupil to take pleasure. So this appreciation of sickness is something which Swinburne was the first to introduce into the literature for Botticelli and Filipino, which was then picked up by Pater and then became a standard trope, together with the idea of melancholy. But it finds its origin in Swinburne. And one finds the exact same sentiment, or similar sentiment, in the young Bernard Berenson. Uh, here he is with Mary Costello, uh, later to become his wife. Berenson was a rather small man, and Mary was a very large woman. So this is a, I love this photograph because Berenson's behind a wall here, so you can't really see the, uh, the two figures. And he wrote this letter um, in 1890, and he says that Filipinos women look a bit ailing very much the same sentiment as the sickness that Swinburne had praised. The refinement is almost that of the ideal Louisiana. In this rather long letter, he's describing a visit to the Strozzi Chapel, seen on the right, and he says, Filipino is my subject today, and I certainly never enjoyed anyone more. His charm is infinite. It's a, you feel as if a movement had reached its culminating point in him. And this was the poetic appreciation that Berenson had in 1890 for Filipino. And just <coughs> six years later, in one of the four Gospels, as it were, the Florentine painters, Berenson's tone is quite different. We need not dwell on these popularizers, <coughs> not even Filipino, not even worth discussion. But what happened between 1890 and 1896? Well, part of the insight is in yet another unpublished essay that I found at Itatu, which I recently published a couple of years ago. This one is by Mary Berenson, called Botticelli and his Critics, and it's a, it's a quirky article by Costello, or perhaps mine too, but in any case, Costello um, has a very odd take, but it's interesting because it's the only example I know of in which an art historian is writing about the Botticelli craze at the time when it's taking place. And she talks about a remarkable phenomenon of our time, the immense popularity in, among Anglo-Saxons of Botticelli, and how is that to be explained? And the explanation, she says, turn, one must turn back to the pre-Raphaelites, the artists and poets, including writers like Swinburne, writers which she, Mary, and Bernard appreciated and were very much in the sway of in the early 14, 1890s. But then there was a dramatic shift away from this poetic appreciation to what they and we would consider connoisseurship. And a key moment in that we find in a letter from Bernard to Mary of 1893. 
And Bernard expresses his concern about a huge book by a German. He didn't even know who he was. Uh, on Botticelli has appeared. I doubt it will, be, it will prove so good that we will be tempted to give up our scheme. What that scheme is, I'll get back to in a moment. The book on the right, you can see it, it's been republished recently. It's called a Forgotten Books, but it is the first monograph on Botticelli by Henrik Ullmann. And what Bernard and Mary decide to do is something which I think would not be considered particularly um, meet professional standards today. They both decided to write reviews attacking the book. They both did it under assumed names, and they're both supporting each other. And in fact, Mary did this a number of times, that she would support the type of research which Berenson was doing. So she was collaborating, building up his reputation uh, behind the curtains, as it were. So, uh, these are the two reviews which came out. And I want to begin with the one by a certain MC. It's Mary's. And here she says the connoisseurship is the identification of resemblances between works of art so close as to indicate authorship. The finding of likeness between artists and artists so great they point to the existence of a personal connection. So there you have it. That is a definition of connoisseurship, at least in the circle of Bernard and Mary. Um, this is a new type of connoisseurship, which Bernard and Mary, I think, but certainly Bernard was developing and Mary was celebrating. Now, this, the document that I found at Itanti, um, which has also been published, is found independently by Ben Trella, and we both published it, at least parts of it. This must be the scheme which Berenson refers to, because it, it's called Scheme for Work on Botticelli. And it begins, uh, fortunately, in 1894, Berenson had legible handwriting. That changes soon after. But here, I think you could read that he starts, in the very stock with, starts at the very top with the materials that one needs to study any artist, but a Botticelli. Contemporary documents, you have to consider early traditions, and the pictures themselves. But these first must be sifted and distinguished from imitators. Well, you may recognize this as being almost word for word what Berenson published in The Rudiments of Connoisseurship in 1902, where in the preface he says, this is an essay that he'd been working on for eight years. In short, what we know as the rudiments of connoisseurship began as a work on Botticelli. Because Botticelli was not just another artist. This is the moment when there was a rage, a fascination in Botticelli, and there was an enormous confusion about Botticelli and his followers and his imitators. And therefore, for the early connoisseurs, for Berenson, it was absolutely essential to distinguish who Botticelli was, as opposed to his imitators. This was, by the way, the exact same goal that, Ber that uh, in the same years, Horn took on, and which he mentioned in the preface to his own volume. Specifically, in this scheme, which is not clear if it was supposed to be an article or a book, but elsewhere he, he refers to writing a book. In any case, Bernard refers to the necessity of establishing the personality of imitators to better distinguish their works from masters. The word personality is important here. It's not a matter of simply identifying the appropriate fingernails and earlobes. He's distinguishing himself from Morelli. He's saying you have to understand the whole approach of an artist. And therefore, out of this goal, out of this need to understand the personality of an artist, we find Berenson creating a personality. So the Amico di Sandro was the culmination of the new method which Berenson is describing in this scheme, and which Mary is praising in her critical review of Ullman's book. In Berenson's own review, he writes, and 
I'm translating back to what might have been Berenstein's original English or something like it. Another word on the discoveries of Monsieur Ullmann. He attributed the portrait in the Louvre to Botticelli, rightly, I might add. Uh, but Berenstein says, well, it is certainly not by this artist, but it might be by Filippino, or rather by an intermediary artist, such as the author of The Death of Lucretia in the Pitti. So when he's attacking Ullmann for not separating the master from his imitators, that is the first reference that I know of to what later became Domingo di Sandro. Berenson also re reviewed this very obscure book. I don't know if any of you know it. I didn't know it. And I think the only reason why Berenson decided to review a guidebook is because he gave an opportunity to correct dozens of attributions. And here he says that the death of Lucretia is really by an artist unnamed artist of great fascination, who is the author of several works similar in style to this, including his Pendant in the Louvre and the Adoration of the Magi in the London National Gallery. Now, surprisingly, um, as Patrizia Zambrano pointed out, Berenson was not the first to make this grouping. Frizzoni did, and Frizzoni, the protege and collaborator of Morelli, was friends with Berenson. And in 1891, Rizzoni, specifically speaking about the London Adoration, he says that it's by a condiscepolo di Sandro e di Filippino, come probabile che si derivato dello stesso pittore certo episodio della morte di Lucrezia in the Pitti Palace, he says. So this grouping of three was first published, actually, by Rizzoni. I'm not saying that Berenson stole the idea. I don't really know who came up with the idea first. Certainly, Trizzoni and Berenson continued to be friends and exchange letters in the 90s. Um, in any case, the idea was first appears in print with Trizzoni and then developed by Bernard and Mary. This book they decided to review about the collection at Chanty, and I think the reason they decided to review this book um, was because it included the story of Esther, where Mary, writing in The Nation, it was an American journal, a uh, newspaper, um, said that the story of Esther is a masterpiece by some nameless great Florentine akin to Botticelli. So she doesn't know the name, writing in January. But a few months later, Bernard comes up with a name in another review of the exact same book. So once again, the two of them are working together reviewing the same book, supporting each other. So here Bernard says that the author of the Chantilly story of Esther is the master of the death of Lucretia. And here, Berenson goes on to explain the personality that was so important to him. He's a somewhat older man than Filippino. Thus, he's, he doesn't agree with Rizzoni that it's a student of Filippino. He's older than Filippino and stands closer to Filippino than both uh, Filippo and Botticelli. That he has a confusing likeness to Filippino is, of course, undeniable. But, I hear for a seminar on connoisseurship, this sentence is important. It is the business of connoisseurship, not humanism, not archivism, but of the exquisite science and art of connoisseurship to recognize delicate distinctions. So he's, um, you say in English, he, he's putting all his eggs in this basket. He's, he's giving a lot of emphasis to the fact that to show that you're a connoisseur, you need to be able to distinguish one from the other. And he, Berenson, staking his uh, new fame on this creation, the master of the death of Lucretia. Three years later, he decides to publish it, and he writes to the editor of the Gazette des Arts that I've just sent off an article on Domingo di Sandro, the artist who formerly I used to call the author, uh, the death of uh, the author, the uh, death of the uh, the, the Lucrezia. In his article, there are a number of footnotes which include and criticize Cavacaselli, Ullmann, Morelli, uh, praises Horn, but he doesn't mention Pizzoni, which I find uh, striking, to say the least. And much of the wording 
that we find in the Amico di Sandro article in the original English is very similar to that in the review of the uh, Mass of the Death of Lucretia. So in the former, he says that the master is dainty, his movement is graceful and vivacious. And in the Mico di Sandro, we find a reference to the lightness of touch, charm of color and tone, a vivacity of sentiments, which seldom grace Filipino, the younger and relatively more laborious painter. So by this point, Philip uh, Berenson had decided that this charming artist was not so charming after all, Filipino. But I should emphasize that although Berenson was separating the, what we would call the early works of Filipino from the later, his great praise in 1890 was for a late work, the Strozzi Chapel. So Berenson completely takes a different approach to Filipino when he's creating Filipino di Sandro. Specifically in this painting, the three archangels in Turin, Berenson says, that the figures are slim and graceful. Again, the wording is, is extremely similar. The coloring is gay and fresh. The movement of the group is full of spring. The dainty movement, he would have said a few years earlier. But the Achilles heel in Berenson's creation of the Mico di Sandro is the painting then and now known as the Corsini Tondo. Berenson wrote in his article that it is so much like the Amico that I hesitated for years questioning whether it was his or Filipino's. I could verify that. In, in earlier writing, he does give it to the Amico. But now, he says in 1899, now I was able to decide that the painting is by Filipino only after I had clearly defined the personality of the Amico. The problem was that, as Berenson himself recognized, Filipino certainly painted the Magrini altarpiece in Luca, which is um, probably one of the works which is mentioned by Vasari. And even just at a glance on the screen, I think you could see that the uh, St. Helen in the Magrini altarpiece is clearly by the same hand as the Corsini Tondo in Florence. So this is what caused Berenson no problem. And Horn noticed the same similarity. In 18, I'm sorry, 1909, Horn sent his friend Roger Fry photographs of the Luca altarpiece and the Corsini Tondo. And in his uh, letter, which had been discussed by Carolyn Elam and Carl Strelke and Patrizia Zambrano and others, Horn says that these two are clearly by the same artist, together with the story of Esther and the Adoration of the Magi. So Horn realized that given that the Luca altarpiece is certainly by Filipino, they all must be by Philip Filipino. And then he makes a historical argument, something that Berenson was never interested in doing. In the same letter he says, Filipino was already working with Botticelli in 1472. And it's very unlikely that all the many works which came from Botticelli's Bottega in the 70s, nothing by Filipino should have survived. So here we see a very different approach. As opposed to Berenson simply trying to understand the personality of an artist, Horn, of course, is looking at the documents, the workshop organization, and trying to use that to understand the attribution of the works. And he goes on to say, in the same letter, a group of letters, he refers to the four panels depicting the story of the Stagio de Leonesti. And Horn says to Fry that, but it shows the Stagio paintings afford another instance, the story of Esther being one, another instance of how such furniture panels wanted in hurry for a marriage were carried out by several hands. Well, this, I think, is very important, because Baron, uh, Berenson and Horn, Horn in his monograph, which had been published a year earlier, he acknowledges that the story of Nastasia de Leonesti was painted by different hands, but they were designed by Botticelli, and he attributes them to Botticelli. 
And he's saying that the same procedure is true of the story of Esther. And this is the fourth reason I, I think it's important for us to reconsider the story today in a series of uh, lessons devoted to connoisseurship. Because even today, this is a debated issue. What is a Botticelli? What is a Filipino? If you only look at who is holding the paintbrush, in the story of Esther, it would be Filipino. But if you're saying who designed it, some scholars, such as Horn, and I follow him, uh, would say that it's a work by Botticelli's workshop with the collaboration of Filipino. So this is not just a topic of interest, a mistake by Berenson 120 years ago. It's a topic of great interest today, to some academics at least, to museums who have to decide labels, and to collectors. Yes, collectors. The market is very important for our story. Because what set off this whole flurry of letters between Horn and Fry was a work of, which is painting they were not for sale. So this uh, Stories of Mary Magdalene, which most scholars attribute to Botticelli, was offered to Fry when he was then at the Metropolitan Museum of New York. The trustees refused to buy it. So Fry suggested that it be sold to, uh, that Horn tried to sell it to Johnson. And both Horn and Fry told Johnson that this was a work by Botticelli. But then Berenson saw the work and he said, no, this is a work by Amico di Sandro. And Mary also, in her letter, said it's a work by Amico di Sandro. Well, you can imagine, Fry and both Horn were furious. Horn, his whole reputation, his book had just come out on Botticelli. And here was someone telling him that he didn't know what a Botticelli was. So he wrote to Fry that my article on the Johnson panels, because he wanted to write on these, um, he'll follow up with another one on the story of Esther, which will give me the opportunity to dissect this blooming amico. The article finally came out in 1913, and Horn says it puts in a new light this, uh, this Fridella panel, works not only by Sandro's hand, but also those by his school. That group of works by his early workshop, so different in character and quality, of which many have been attributed in the confusion of every scientific criteria to that imaginary master, the Amico di Sandro. So here in print, Horn says that Amico di Sandro did not exist. Other scholars followed in print, and then Berenson himself came to agree. In Berenson's Painters of the uh, Florentine Artists in 1936, he simply doesn't mention the Amico di Sandro. And then, in the 38th edition of the Drawings of the Florentine Painters, he includes a short appendix on the Amico di Sandro, where he explains that he made an error. And he says that he would prefer to consider artists as discarnate torchbearers, without any civic existence. It's an extraordinary phrase. So he's no longer interested in flesh and bone, you know, Artists, artists in carne also. He wants to see them as discarnate torchbearers. So in 38, writing in this essay, he's become in some ways very close to where he began, interested in this poetic approach to uh, the art of Botticelli in the school. Thank you very much. <laughs>